Well, I am so glad I found you I was out here on my own Couldn't find a single place Where I could feel at home I was just amazed to see That you'd been here for so long I'm grateful that you persevered I wrote you all this song I was thinking mango thoughts in a meatloaf town. The food for thought was all the same. It really brought me down. Nothing on the heavenly buffet line was satisfying. My appetite for truth and right. Hello and welcome to the Progressive Redneck Preacher. I'm your Progressive Redneck Preacher, Michael Royal. For those of you new to our podcast, here at the Progressive Redneck Preacher, we try to lift up voices and stories that often get overlooked. I don't know about you, but when I watch the news or look at my Facebook feed, I see again and again stories of people of faith, people with deeply southern small town values like my own and how the stories that get lifted up of folks like that are almost always stories of people using those values and that faith to build walls to keep apart people who they look at as different or to build bats to beat them down and I find so often that there are a lot of people like me with deeply deeply held faith and with deeply southern and small town values who it's not despite that faith not despite those values but precisely because of the message of Jesus or of their faith or the uh, southern belief in hospitality to strangers that they go out and do justice work they go and build bridges rather than walls and uh, we have just such a voice we're going to be hearing today, uh, Reverend Angela Robertson, who, like me, grew up here in North Carolina and is deeply shaped by that experience. And she's going to be talking about some justice work she's been doing in the community and in the church. Welcome, Angela. Thank you so much, Mike. I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm really glad to have you here and excited that you're taking this time. Well, you know, Angela, I always like to start by sitting down at the table. My, my late mama used to say, come on and put your feet underneath the table. And when she said that, you knew you were welcome and you were going to be treated like, like family. And I think that's a good place to start. So uh, put your feet up under the table. Under there. There we go. And I see you brought some food you wanted to share. Yes. Um, I brought some... Um mixed fruit, uh, fresh fruit, and um, and some pecans. Mm. Um, I'm per- particularly the apples, they're green apples and they're red apples, um, because I was uh, born and raised in eastern North Carolina, mm-hmm. um, outside of Greenville, home of the ECU Pirates. You know, Daddy and Mama were both pirates, so <laughs> go pirates! <laughs> And uh, my paternal grandmother had, uh, and grandfather, they had pecan trees and apple trees on their property. Mm -hmm. And growing up, I spent a large part of my summers at uh, their home. And so when I think about the South, when I think about North Carolina, when I think about Eastern North Carolina, Mm -hmm. I think about pecans and I think about apples. And so that's why I brought those today. Oh, that's great. Now, let me ask you, whenever I hear another Southerner talk about pecans or pecans, I like to ask where they are on that debate. You know, growing up, we picked them at Grandma's house, too. And I remember this man from church who who argued it had to be pecans, not pecans. And for like 15 minutes, he'd sit and argue that. Where are you on that debate? I don't argue about it, but it's pecans. It's pecans. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I think I'd rather not argue and just eat it myself. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for sharing it. It looks lovely. And part of what I was interested in talking about is uh, 
Earlier this year, I was blessed to go and hear you speak at your church in a series about criminal justice. Mm -hmm. And um, I know the, this last year, especially, but for several years, I've been noticing all well, the issues we're dealing with criminal justice, both with the criminal justice system and po also policing. The town where I live, Durham, that's been a big deal. But I mean, we've seen some of our young people in the news dealing with that and and I thought it was wonderful to see a person speaking in the church about those issues so uh, would you tell us a little bit about what drew you to be interested in criminal justice reform and what that means to you so the first thing I, I should say is that my first degree my bachelor's mm -hmm. degree is in criminal justice okay and um, so I've been in, in, interested in the field of criminal justice for quite some time my first degree is in it. My first criminal justice job was with um, Pitt County Sheriff's Department mm -hmm. as a victim's advocate. Mm -hmm. And I've also served as a uh, jail and prison ministry chaplain. And so I have professional experience around the issue. What draws me to it theologically mm -hmm. is, and what I want to help people to do, is to think about criminal justice mm -hmm. theologically. Mm -hmm. And what I ask Christians especially to do is to take seriously that the one that they call Savior was a felon. Mm. Wow, that's that's strong words there. He wasn't he was arrested, you know. Yeah. Yeah. He was tried, you know. Mm -hmm. He was found guilty. Mm. And they convicted and uh Gave him the death penalty for that. Yeah. So I try to help Christians to understand that this is not just a political issue. Mm -hmm. It is a political issue, but it's not just a political issue. Yeah. It is a political issue. It is a social issue. It is a moral issue. It's an ethical issue. It is a biblical issue. It is a religious issue. It's a church issue. Mm. And that if we come to it... If we come to criminal justice reform with, a health, with our healthy Christian convictions and think about this theologically, mm. it might help us to think about criminal justice transformation. Mm. Because the one that we call Savior, uh, somebody snitched on him. That's yeah, true. Yeah. We don't usually think about Judas as a snitch yeah. or Jesus as a felon. Yeah. <laughs> So somebody snitched on him. He was um, arrested in, in the dark of night. Oh. They stripped him. He, he knows what it is to go through a strip search. <laughs> uh, he was arrested. He was beaten while he was in police custody. They exchanged his um, street clothes mm. for prison garb. That's true. And uh, he was convicted. Uh, oh, and did I uh, let me not forget to mention that they brought up false witnesses? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some trumped up charges. Yeah, yeah, and but they convicted him, and uh, he suffered the ultimate penalty, the death penalty. So Jesus endured the criminal justice system of his day. Hmm. And we ought to think seriously about what that means for Christianity and for our society. Hmm. That's the chief way in which I look at it. I think that's, that's a refreshing thing, I think, to hear a Christian say. I know I was at an event about immigration uh, earlier, and uh, a lady raised her hand because people were talking about felons in order to help them. And, and she says, you know... I always like to ask people, what do they mean by felon? And she brought up, you know, do people realize you can have just a little dime bag of pot and be a felon? Do you think somebody who has a dime bag of pot once ought to not deserve any help? And she says she usually says this to people who say that anybody who ever committed a crime is a criminal for life and horrible. But uh, I had never heard anybody mention before the idea that our Savior legally was a felon. And we might... We might say that it was unfair, but isn't that what so many people mistreated uh, 
by the police or the criminal justice system also say. Exactly, exactly. So if you as a Christian say, but Jesus was innocent. Right. You know, if that's your, if that's your retort, right. right? If your reply is, but Jesus was innocent. Right. Pause for a minute because there are a lot of innocent people in our current system. Oh, yes. And then let's say, let's say, um, um, there, there, there are people who've been snitched on. There are people who've been ratted on. There are mm-hmm. people who, uh, someone else gave false evidence and false testimony so that they could save their own skin. And when they saved their own skin, though, that meant that you uh, got arrested because um, this person's trying to save their skin. They're giving something in exchange mm-hmm. for saving themselves. Right. <laughs> right. They're giving something in exchange for saving themselves. But 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 this is going to take me down another uh, trail, but I'm going to try to quickly retract, sure. go, go back on this. But Jesus gave his life. Yeah. He, he's, he gave his life for us. But the point is, he endured what many people in our society endured. Mm-hmm. You know, someone snitched. There was false testimony. He was beaten while he was in police custody. And he suffered the ultimate uh, cost. He suffered the death penalty. We should interrogate our current criminal justice system along these same lines. So that every part of the system gets interrogated theologically. What does it mean? Because one of the other ways I look at the issue is... There are more people, um, more black people, who are in the criminal justice system today than there were slaves in 1850. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't know that. There, I brought the, let me see what this, how many, I brought that somewhere. That um, in 1850, there were three million nine hundred and fifty thousand five hundred and twenty eight slaves in the United States Mm. in 1850 today in 2017 there are more black people caught up in the criminal justice system that is uh, jail prison uh, parole probation caught up in the criminal justice system than there were slaves in 1850 Mm-hmm. And so, when we did our criminal justice Bible study, we had some resources. We have, of course, the resource of the Bible. One of the things that I did was to take Mark. So, our good biblical scholars tell us that Mark was actually the first gospel. Mm-hmm. So, we started with Mark. And we looked at the from Jesus from arrest to death. We, we read the whole, oh, the, all the passages. Oh, wow, great. And as we are doing that, we're looking at the criminal justice system today. Yeah. So we go through that whole scenario. But what we also do is we use some other contemporary sources, like the New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander and uh, the Death of Innocence by uh, Sister Helen Prejean. And our main text, the text that our church read, um, and that we used um, mostly was Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson Mm -hmm. Um, because we want to look at it we want to say okay so Jesus went through this what does that mean for us as Christians and then what are the current statistics and what is going on contemporaneously in our society another thing we ought to think about and take seriously is that the United States has 5% of the world's population, mm-hmm. but 25% of the world's prisons. Mm. One fourth of the world's prison population is incarcerated in the United States. Yeah. It's astounding. I know I have a friend who was from Germany as a ministerial intern. Yeah. In the U.S., and one of the things I remember talking to her about is how shocking 
you know, Germany is similar to us, it's a developed nation, mm -hmm. to see how we handle criminal justice. Mm -hmm. Because they would never treat German citizens now like that. Which is even more shocking if you remember, you know, how Germany was when we went to war with them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but we are still, we have some other agenda at play with how we do criminal justice than so, they do there. So one of the things to ask ourselves, there are a lot of things to ask ourselves, but one of the things to ask ourselves is, why are we so punitive? Mm -hmm. Maybe it has something to do about the way we think about um, salvation mm -hmm. uh, and the way we think about God. Um, do we really believe in a God of justice? And do we really believe in a God of mercy? Mm -hmm. Do we really? Or do we just believe in a God of punishment? Yeah. Well, you know, I, when you talk about justice and mercy, one of the most transformative quotes I ever read, you know, I grew up in this tradition that said, you know, Jesus died because God had to punish somebody, uh, you know. And I'm, I don't, I'm not sure where you are on that, but it was this sense that God had to get a, a pound of flesh. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus did it for us. And there's a part of that that's beautiful, but there's a part of that that's a little a frightening picture of God. Mm -hmm. And of Jesus, even, you know. Mm -hmm. God having to torture and kill his own son, you know. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. And he talked about love and justice. He says, you know, that love is the centerpiece of the Christian faith. And justice, which I'd always heard of making people punish, you know, you know, burning it forever in hell, you know. He said justice is removing every boundary to love. Mm. And for me at least, when I hear you talk about justice and mercy, that's a that's a way of thinking about it, his way of talking about it, where I can see the two coming together, whereas when I grew up with this image of justice being God's got to cut a pound of flesh off you, it's hard to see those as combinable, you know? So one of the things that um, I try to, uh, I preached as part of a message uh, sermon here, um, that in the Hebrew, <laughs> righteousness and justice are the same word. Mm. So, you know, I, I think about in, in my traditions, my religious traditions, how people say, I want to be right with God. Mm -hmm. I just want to do what's right. Mm -hmm. You know, I just want to be pleasing to the Lord. Because what I'm trying to lift up is that sometimes people don't think, when, when, they, when they think being right with God, it's like, uh, they, they don't think about they don't hear the word justice right and and, and the, 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 what I'm trying to get at is somehow I think in the United States that what, that part of what Christianity has been about is about this relationship with God mm -hmm. that somehow or another gets disassociated with my relationships with one another. Yeah, yeah. Because I want to be right with God, but then I don't give you justice. Yeah. Or I don't help to create just systems in the society. Mm -hmm. And somehow there's this big disconnect whereby and it's in this all is in a way it's kind of amazing to me how people can gather together in houses of worship and in their houses of worship they can talk about being right with God while simultaneously clapping for injustice yeah I, I hesitate to say promoting. That might be true in some cases, but I think it's more of just kind of standing on the sidelines and letting injustice right. go forward and not really thinking that injustice is unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. And unrighteousness in the society is displeasing to God. Right. So it cannot be pleasing to God. 
that we have 5% of the world's population mm -hmm. and 25% mm -hmm. of the world's uh, population in prison. That cannot be pleasing to God. It cannot be pleasing to God that there are more African Americans touched in one way or another by the criminal justice system than there were slaves in 1850. Right. This cannot be pleasing to God. Right. And we, we have to start also looking at these things more systematically that there are reasons for which these things are true. And it's not just that you are that you went out and committed an offense, right? Because as what uh, Michelle Alexander brings out in her book, you know, it, and it gets back to the just mercy piece. Is it justice? Is it righteous that because you committed a crime at some point in your life, that you that now you no longer have access to anything? So you, you do your time, but you can't go live with your mama in public housing when you get right. out. Or your sister, or your uncle, or your granddaddy in public housing when you get out. And God forbid you want to get a job or go to school, right? Yeah, so I had a debate one time. That is where I did enter into a debate. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I entered into a debate one time with someone who was saying to me, People who get incarcerated, people who become in prison, they need to just do their time. I don't really care about that. They don't have anything to do while they're doing their time. Right. They don't need to have. I don't need, they're saying, I as a uh, Jane Q citizen doesn't okay. need to pay anything for them to um, be educated while they're incarcerated because they just need to do their time. I worked at a for a local community college that did GED and um, CRC, uh, uh, career readiness programs, in the prison. Mm -hmm. And there are some smart people in prison. Mm -hmm. There are some people with great minds in prison. There are some people who want to change their, cha change their lives. Why shouldn't we be invested in them being educated so that when they leave prison, so what are we saying when you leave prison? That you just do what? Right. What do you do? Once you have served your sentence, what then do you do? If we cut off all the options after you come out, mm -hmm. what do you do with your life? How do you support yourself? How do you support your family? How do you make how is it then that you make a better person of yourself? If everything uh, in the society is cut off from you. Yeah. And is that justice? And where is the mercy in that? Mm -hmm. And I thought we believed in a forgiving God. I was thinking about this this morning. Forgiveness doesn't mean that there aren't consequences. Because if you go out here and slash my tires, I am going to call the police. Right. Micah. I am. Thanks for the warning. <laughs> <laughs> and Micah, I will forgive you for cutting my tires. But you know what? I expect some reimbursement. Right. The point is that I'm trying to make is that a for forgiveness, because I think people get confused. That like, part of the thing they get confused is, one, that we do indeed have a forgiving God. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a text that says that he throws all of our sins in the sea of forgiveness. Right. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, in my covenant relationship with you, Micah, that if I hurt you, that there aren't some consequences or repercussions behind the hurt that I shed upon you. Yeah. But the thing about it is with, with forgiveness and reconciliation, we can we can be able to move forward from mm -hmm. that. But if in our society, in regards to criminal justice, if we don't have avenues and pathways by which people can become better and do uh, good things, how is it that they're supposed to go on with their lives? Mm -hmm. And this and these things don't just affect them; it affects their children. Any because. 
Um, the criminal justice system does not just impact the person who's in it. Right. It also impacts everyone who is attached to them. Mm-hmm. So their mama, their daddy, whoever they have attachments with, their girlfriend, their, their wife, children. their children, whoever they have attachments with, that the system is also affecting that th- those people as well. Yeah. Do we want health and wholeness, or do we just want punishment? Hmm. Well, I think those are good questions. So let me let me ask you this: as we think about that. There are probably some people still who are listening, you know, who are still weighing out how they 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 think about it, how they feel. But I know there's a lot of people who are like I have been at times and, and sitting there saying, well, you know, that makes sense. But what what can I do uh, as just this ordinary person? Or what can my church do or my synagogue do? Um, what are some of the things you found as you, as you have worked in the criminal justice system and also you provided this training for your church, and I know some other settings you've done some training on this. What are some things you found that are pe- that are either programs a church can have, education opportunities, or things in the community they can be involved with to help change the system on some level? So we had a criminal justice transformation Bible study here, and the folks who attended just absolutely loved it. Number one is because they got to hear material that they hadn't heard before. And they got to hear it in a concentrated kind of setting whereby they got to ask their own questions uh, from those who were leaders. Uh, Because what we did, we had uh, people in the, professionals in the community came and talked about their various programs. So we had people from the prison, we had people from the jail, Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, people um, on the front lines of the criminal justice system, the police department, come to us and talk about their their job, their role, their profession, what they're doing in the community, etc. So that in and of itself was good because people got to, one, interface mm-hmm. with people who are actually doing the work. We need to know our neighbors mm-hmm. and we need to know what's available to us and we need to know what people are doing. So the other thing I want to say is get to know what resources are in the community and partner with them. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes I think what churches do is they hear about things and they think that they have to recreate, they have to create something or recreate something. And what I'm trying to say is, okay, so there's, there's, there's a jail here. Talk with the chaplain. How can you support people in the community? Can you give kids toys right. in the name of the parent? Can yeah. you give kids toys at Christmas? Can you, someone who's incarcerated, can you uh, take a Thanksgiving dinner over? Can you adopt someone? Do, do you have job leads that mm-hmm. you can uh, give to people? Um, um, someone that, one of the things that happened is um, a gentleman who I had uh, taught at the prison. Uh, I'm just in the community one day and he hollers out and I recognize him and we start out a chat and he's so he's out of prison now. Yeah. And him and his mom are trying to move to a new place and he says we need a we need a washer. Mm. So I send out a uh, email yeah. to all my pastor friends in the community mm-hmm. and the man gets a washer. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. The 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 most the more practical and tangible you can be the yeah. better uh, with prison ministry could you adopt a family a mom or and some kids mm-hmm. that need a ride to go see their their dad or their husband or their their boyfriend the the the, the dad of uh, of the kids could could you could you do that once a month uh, um, how you know? Just think about tangible, practical ways that you can help, that you can bless somebody. And the way you do it is start with who's in your community. Well, that sounds like some advice I everyone can do: that individual connections and build the relationships in the community. Do you have any thoughts about how folks can engage the systematic issues you were talking about too? Because I hear there's 
two levels I hear. Um, I've heard people, you know, quote Micah where it says, you know, what's the Lord require of you? Do justice, love mercy. Mm-hmm. Walk humbly with my God. I mean, like mercy and compassion is that one-on-one. Justice can be that too, but it can also be changing the system. What are, Any thoughts about beginning points for people engaging, changing the system? So, you know, you got to know, you, you got to be on top of who's running for office and what do they believe about these issues. Mm-hmm. And, you know, let's be honest, most of us got our own self-interested kind of issues mm-hmm. that directly impact us. Um, I, I honestly don't have a, um, a mama, daddy, granddaddy, uh, sister, brother, aunt or uncle, not even a first cousin that's incarcerated. Right. I don't. Right. But that doesn't mean that I can't be interested, that I can't know more broadly how this system impacts my community. Mm -hmm. And so who's in office and who's running for office and what do they think about? Where would they vote on things like the death penalty, Mm -hmm. like stop and frisk? Right. Where where would they, where would the, those where would those who are running for office or are presently in office where do they stand on issues like that, and holding them accountable? Mm-hmm. Their phone numbers or public information. Yeah, you can find out uh, grassroots organizations within the community and partner mm-hmm. with them. Show up at a uh, do some letter writing, do some phone calling. Right. And know who's running for office and ask those questions of them. Well, that sounds that sounds like a good start. And one of the great things about it, from my experience, is uh, it's not anything people have to do alone. I, f- I feel like in every community you've got a group of unsung heroes. They might be small, they might be large. Who're doing that? And uh, it's beautiful to imagine if in all of our churches, people connected with those heroes. Well engaged. Because w- one of the things that I strive to do in my pastoral work is to try to help people look at issues differently than what they're hearing about it in the media. Mm-hmm. And for me, the way to help them to engage it differently is to help them engage it theologically. Yeah. Well, I think that's a real gift you've brought to this discussion because I've heard people talk about this a lot of ways and even some really powerful ways in the church, but I've heard very few people talk about thinking of it with Christ at the center, which is exactly what we say we're about. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, Reverend Robertson, and hopefully we'll do this again. Thank you. Appreciate it so much. I was thinking mango thoughts in this meatloaf town. Now my soul is on a roll, I got you folks all around. We got us a feast for the spirit, a feast for the mind. We speak the truth, walk in love. We remember to be kind. Well, that's what the ending would be if I were a sweet and earnest person. Lord knows I do try, but here's the real ending. We got us a feast for the spirit and a feast for the mind. But in case of rapture, pack a snack, cause we'll be left behind.
my soul is on a roll I got you folks all around We got us a feast for the spirit And a feast for the mind We speak the truth Walk in love We remember to be kind Well, that's what the ending would be If I were a sweet and earnest person and Lord knows I do try but here's the real ending we got us a feast for the spirit and a feast for the mind but in case of rapture pack a snack cause we'll be left behind